Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians 5, begin in verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, and they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I've often thought about being in Paul's position as he was writing to the church at Corinth. And, of course, we have these two letters. And in both instances, he had to deal with things that uh, were unpleasant. In fact, at one point, uh, some of them actually accused him of being insane. I mean, here was a man that was so radical, so different, uh, so zealous that they thought there's something wrong with this guy. And back up in verse number uh, verse number 13, he said, whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. And so he's answering the accusations against him. Some accused him of lying, that... Uh, He had told him, I'm coming to see you, and he didn't show up, and he had to explain why he wasn't there when they expected him. It was because God had opened a door somewhere else and that he was following the leadership of the Lord. But he was dealing with, uh, he was dealing with some very immature Christians in that church. But when we come down to verse number 14, He is addressing all of them, and he gets down to the basic root of all of our needs, all of the answers to our problems in life, and that is the love of Christ. Every pastor, I suspect every pastor does, I think most of them, as soon as they finish one message, they start thinking and maybe praying about what am I going to preach next week. Some, they've just decided I'm not just to do nothing but preach series of messages, and if that's the way God leads them, that's okay. That makes it a lot easier when you just preach a series. You know exactly where you're going, and uh, sometimes we have series. But uh, sometimes you're just, uh, I'll use the word flabbergasted or confused. or you, You don't know what to do next. You really don't. And uh, preachers' wives, they've probably heard the preacher say, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to preach next week. I just don't know. Pray with me about that because I just don't know where to go next. Well, there's a good bit of truth in the old saying, when you don't know what to preach, just preach about Jesus. Amen. Amen. I mean, that, that, that covers it all. Ever since I became a Christian, and the fact that I surrendered to preach two months later, I was inspired by reading everything I could find about uh, the great Christians of the past. I mean, all of them, missionaries, pastors, whatever they were. I I, I go to used bookstores and have the money to, or the means back then to order the books and uh, I'd go scrounge through those old used bookstores looking for some treasure uh, of a book that was hard to find and uh, it was so inspirational to read and uh, you think about uh, the great missionaries of the past you know I mentioned David Livingston and I could go on and mention several more and the name is familiar to just about everybody here. But they've never really read the story of what those people went through, the suffering, the agony, the sacrifices they made in order to proclaim the gospel to those that have never heard. 
but of all of those other stories that I've been inspired by, there's nobody that measures up to the Apostle Paul. When you put yourself in his shoes and think about all of the suffering that he went through, uh, who can measure up to that? His commitment to Christ, the depth of his concern for others, his contribution to the world, in fact, goes unmatched by anyone since Christ. Nobody can measure up to that. Thank God the gospel went to the west rather than to the east and Thank God here was a man that was willing to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and go the direction God wanted him to go. But the question is, then what, what is it that made Paul so great? I believe the answer is found right here in our text. For the love of God constraineth us. The love of God constraineth us. You see, for Paul, life was all about Christ. Philippians 1.21, he said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me to live is Christ. It might be something different for someone else, but for Paul it was Christ, and it ought to be that way for each and every one of us. And that's why I mentioned earlier that his dedication to the Lord was so radical that some of them literally considered him to have lost his mind. They said he was mad. And so how else do you describe a person that is willingly and joyfully subjecting himself to such a great life of suffering? He, he didn't complain about it. He said, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. Put me in prison. Beat me. Do whatever you want. I'm not only content, but I will receive it with joy. How do you describe someone like that? The answer is you call him a Christian. That ought to be the normal Christian life for all of us. Watchman Nee wrote a book called The Normal Christian Life many years ago. I'll never forget reading it for the first time. And so many people base base their state of maturity upon what is average. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm as good as anyone else, you know, or I'm better than, I've had more knowledge than they do. I've won more souls than they do. I do this better than they. But look, you can be average and nowhere near normal. There are a lot of churches out here that, I mean, the average is pitifully below the line of normal. The normal Christian life is what? The normal Christian life is the Spirit-filled life where we manifest the, the fruit of the Spirit. And, and Paul is living the Christian life. And sadly, I, I, I don't live it as well. And, and, and if you do, thank God for that. Well, my question is, well, how, how do we become such a person? If we're, if we're not on the level with Paul, and if, if, if that's normal Christianity, how do we get to be a normal Christian? How can we get to be a person like Paul? Well, the answer is found right here in our text. Notice the power of Christ's love. The first thing he says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. And usually we look at that word and, and, and we think about it being something that is holding us uh, back. And it, notice he says, for he died for all. He died for all. And, and it was that fact, that, that's the fact upon which his decisions are based, that he died for all. We ought to love Christ and we ought to make it known but keep in mind, it's his love for us that's the most important because we wouldn't love him if he didn't first love us. And he said, that's the fact. That's the thing. That's the factor. That's the force that constrains me. And we think of that as being a restraint, hold them back. But, and it, that word can mean that, by the way. But it can mean more than that. It also means to coerce or to impel it's speaking about a force that influences and controls. And that's what he's saying. It's this fact, the fact of, of the love of Christ, that is the thing that, 
that influences me. That is the thing that controls me. That's the thing that makes me forge ahead and do what I do. You might think I'm crazy, but I do it because I understand that Christ died for all. Brilliant lawyer by the name of Charles Hodge many, many years ago. And I wouldn't agree with him on a lot of things, but he was a critic of Christianity. But he began to read the Word of God and began to study, and he became a Christian and quite a famous preacher and authored several different books. And he made this statement, A Christian is one who recognizes Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and is God manifest in the flesh, loving us and dying for our redemption, and who is so affected by a sense of the, of the love of this incarnate God as to be constrained to make the will of Christ the rule of his obedience and the glory of Christ the great end for which he lives. Now that's well said, and it's said in a way that here's a man with a brilliant mind and describing for us, this is what it means to be a Christian. And the question is, does that describe you? Does that describe you? You know, it's one thing for us to make a profession that we're a Christian based on the fact that, well, we don't want to go to hell. And somebody told me if I say this prayer that I can go to heaven. It's one thing to want to stay out of hell and get to heaven. It's another thing to understand who Christ is and what he did. And that definition pretty well describes it. Understanding who he is and what he did. You say, well, preacher, I, I, that, that's me. I, I believe every word of that. No doubt about it. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. And the desire of my heart is to do the will of God. But desire is one thing and performance is another. You, you know, I, 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 if you tell me you're a Christian, I wouldn't have the audacity to sit here and accuse you of lying. And, and who is it, who am I to, to judge you? And uh, even, even if we could look at one another's faults, because we all act out of character sometime, and sooner or later you can find something wrong with every person here. It, it, it's going to happen. When it does, and you know you have fail God and the spirit convicts you of your failure if you're a Christian if you've been born again there's still that desire in your heart that I want to please God if you don't have that you've never been born again because the moment you're saved the spirit of God comes to indwell you and convicts us of our sins and we can't sin get by with it we can't sin successfully the Spirit of God is going to remind us of our failures. And there are going to be times that maybe you just feel like, well, I, I, I'm just such a miserable failure, I think I'll just give up. I've embarrassed myself so that I, 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 I don't think I'll ever go back to church. They know all about me. I'm just, I, I'm just a failure. I'll go somewhere else or drop out of church altogether. And then there are times that you just get discouraged. For whatever reason, you, you just, maybe you don't even understand. You're like the psalmist, why art thou cast down, O my soul? You don't even understand what is going on, but you find yourself in a state of depression and you, you, you don't feel like doing anything, going anywhere. How do you keep going? How do you press on? How do you get through all of the great difficulties? Well, the same as Paul did. The love of Christ constrains us. It, it, it influences us. It controls us. It is a force. It is a power in our life that enables us. And Paul lived in the awareness of Christ's love for him. That was the force that pushed him along when he felt like quitting. 
It's not something that we can just think about on Sunday morning. That's what a lot of folks do. They come to church on Sunday morning and they, they, they love the people. Oh, the fellowship is great. They love the singing and sometimes they like the preaching okay. And, uh, but when they walk out the door and they start out for the rest of the week, there's no focus on the Lord. And, I, and that's a formula for failure every single time. If we're going to live in the light of the love of Christ, that's something that has to happen every day. It's something that we do over and over and over, and that's the thing that will keep us going when everything is against us. If we do that, there's absolutely no burden that's too heavy for us to bear. We all have burdens, don't we? They're different sorts. The intensity is different, but we're all going through something. And in order to bear that burden, we have to keep our focus on how much the Lord loved us. And there's, listen, there's no distance that is too far for us to go for Him. We talked about missionaries earlier and think about them packing their bags, leaving their friends, their family, Going to a mission field far away. I can so well remember whenever the Lord, the Lord directed my steps to leave Missouri. It's pretty hard when you're raised as a hillbilly there in Missouri and all of a sudden the Lord says, uh, it's t- time to go. I, w- I want you to move to Tennessee. Now, it it would have been easier if he said Tennessee over in the East Tennessee. That's a lot prettier than West, the Western part, the Delta and all of that, you know. But anywhere he would have led me, I had to leave my family, my friends. My wife would have had to left her family and friends. Thank God for a wife that you say, look, the Lord's leading us to Tennessee. And a wife that says, if that's what God's calling you to do, let's pack. And all of these years, that's exactly what she's done. There's never been one moment, not one time ever that she said, I don't want to go. I don't think you ought to go or any such thing. She's always been there to support me. Listen, there's no, I've often told the story and it's, a bit humorous when you think about it. That night I surrendered to preach. I literally said to God, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I will give my life to preach the gospel even if it means going to California. I have no idea why I said that except I... But there, look, there's no, no distance too far for us to go whenever it comes to the love of God. There is no work that's too hard for us to do when it comes to the love of God. No battle too fierce for us to face when it comes to the love of God. Being focused on His, the greatness of His love will keep you going when, when nothing else will. Oh, there's so many examples that we could think of that Think about the missionaries. Think about the great Christians that were not missionaries, but great Christians who suffered horrible things, but they lived in the awareness of God's love for them. That's what worked for Paul. Get over to chapter number 12 over there, and here here, here he is suffering. There's a thorn in the flesh. Whatever it is, it's a thorn in the flesh. He's suffering, and three times he goes to God. He's begging God, please remove this. God said, no. What do you do when God says, no? What can you do? I'm glad that God explained I'm not going to remove it. In the first place, it would have absolutely ruined Paul. Remember, he'd been caught up into the third heaven and saw things not lawful for man to utter. You know, if the Lord just said, do whatever you want, he'd probably wrote a book and tried to become a millionaire. The Lord said, no, that that pain is going to be with you for the rest of your life. 
And he didn't give a really full explanation, did he? But he did give the answer. He said, but my grace shall be sufficient. And the same grace that sustained Paul, that grace, that unmerited love of God that sustained him is available to every one of you here this morning. The power of Christ's love is beyond what we can imagine. Notice, look at verse 14 again. Here's the proof of it. Christ died for all. That shoots down the theology of some folks for sure. He died for all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Aren't you glad that he died for all regardless of who you are, what you've done, where you've been? Christ shed his blood for each and every one of us. And that is the most awesome thought imaginable. And think about it. I want you to think about it and don't ever stop thinking about it. It's like the songwriter said, Oh, oh, oh I could sing of his uh, uh, forever of his love. That's an old, old song, but that's the way you feel. And that's the way Paul felt. Turn over to Ephesians chapter number 3 for just a minute. Ephesians 3 and verse... Verse number 16. And as he's praying for the church at Ephesus, he said that he, that is God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith and being rooted and grounded in love may be able, now listen carefully, may be able to comprehend with all saints, what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That, that's, what he says there is just mind-blowing when you think about the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and he said, I'm praying that God will help you to comprehend, to understand that. And the sheer magnitude of it is more than you can mad- imagine. I wrote an article several years ago called Standing on the Shore. And, and that's the way it is whenever it comes to thinking about the love of God. It's like you stand there on the shore and you look out on the ocean and and you you can't really figure out where the ocean ends and the sky begins. It's just, they all just merge as, as one. There's something mysterious about it and something powerful about it. And that's the way the love of God is. It's beyond our comprehension or description. It's unconditional. Thank God for that. Everlasting. It's powerful. And boy, whenever... Whenever you're troubled by all of your problems and you feel like you're having one of what's called nervous breakdowns and you're just trembling, you don't know what to do next, that fact will not only calm your trembling hand, it'll brighten the darkness of the day that you're going through. Notice he says there in verse 14, it passeth knowledge. It passeth knowledge. It's beyond what we can fully understand. But listen, the the lack of understanding does not diminish from our enjoyment of it. We can't fully comprehend it, but we can appreciate it. And it's that appreciation for what God did for us that is able to motivate us and to take us through the darkest times of life just as it did with Paul. There's absolutely nothing that hinders a Christian more than a lukewarm heart. I started to say nothing hinders a Christian more than a cold heart. But that really wouldn't be accurate. I don't think because whenever the Lord was sending the letter to the church at Ephesus, he said, I would that thou were hot or cold. In other words, I wish he was really on fire and doing what's right, or I wish he was just totally cold. You see, there's hope for the person whenever they realize they reach the depth of their coldness and their lack of spiritual desire. 
whenever they've hit rock bottom, out of their desperation, that's where God reaches most of us, isn't it? In our desperation. But he said, you're lukewarm. You don't, you don't even understand. You don't even realize what a serious spiritual condition you're in. That's, that's what he's saying. He, and he warns him. He said, uh, remember your first love and repent or else. Boy, when God says or else, we, we better listen. Amen. But that lukewarm attitude of thinking that, yeah, everything's all right between me and God when it's really not, will get you in more trouble than anything else as a Christian. So how, if we're in that condition, how can we renew our love for Christ? How, how do we do that? To renew your love, review His love for you. That's the way you do it. If your love has kind of grown lukewarm, you know, and You just become content with things as they are when they're not as they ought to be. You're content with just going one mile instead of two. Just stop and think about how far Jesus went for you. Think about it. He never stopped. He went on through the Gethsemane through the agony of the night betrayal of his friend think about him being so beaten I was talking to Bev this week when we think about the suffering of Christ and all of us have seen a picture of a, what is supposed to be a likeness of Jesus right or you've seen maybe a movie. I don't watch those movies. It bothers me. But, but, but somebody playing the part of Jesus, right? And, you know, we could get into this debate about whether he had long hair or short hair. And, uh, and uh, I can tell you if you want to know, but I, that's, that's not the point. Everybody's got a different idea of what he looked like. In reality, nobody knows what he is like. But when you see those pictures of him hanging on the cross... There's something that's missing. You, you, you see the, the blood spots in his hands and his feet maybe where the spear pierced his side. What you don't realize is, and evidently a lot of folks don't, you want a picture of Jesus on the cross, you couldn't recognize him as a man. He was beaten beyond recognition. Every bone in his body was broken. His face was, was mutilated, as it were, to the point that you couldn't even recognize him as a man. I'm not making that up. That's what the Bible tells us. Amen. That's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. And whenever our love begins to grow cold, we need to just stop and review how much he loved us and what he went through for us. That's the proof of His love, and the power of it compels us to do His will. But notice one last thing, and that's the product of His love. Verse 15, And that He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him who died for them and rose again. That, this is Paul's reasoning about what he's been talking about. This is the reasoning. And the bottom line is that we can't live to please ourselves and live a life that's pleasing to God. It, we just can't do it. If we're going to please God, we have to live according to the will of God. Somebody says, well, I just think to, to even, even to suggest that we ought to live a life like the Apostle Paul did and to willingly put ourselves in difficult places and to give God everything we've got, I, I think that's asking too much of a church member. <clears throat> well, it's not what I expect. It's what God expects that matters. The famous missionary C.T. Studd, 
said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. I believe he told the truth. If Jesus Christ is God, and he is, by the way, and he went through what he went through for you, for me, tasted death for every man, the Bible says. If he did that, we could never make any sacrifice that is unreasonable. What did Paul say in Romans chapter 12? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, yeah, your reasonable service. Here's something that I found interesting. Look back at verse 14 again. And I want you to notice these words. Because we thus judge. Now I'm not a Greek scholar whatsoever. But the Greek scholars, though anybody that's well educated in Greek will tell you that phrase, we thus judge, that's written in the past tense. And that tells us something. That implies that from the moment of conversion, Paul understood that the death of Christ obligated him to live for Christ. We live in a day where so many preachers want to cheapen discipleship, you know, to put it on bargain basement sale, to make it attractive to everyone. The Lord didn't do that. He said, well, you better sit down and count the cost. We need to understand the expectations of God from the moment that we trust Him as our Savior. And Paul, Paul had that attitude, and I can prove it, because when I go back to Acts chapter 9, here on the road to Damascus, and he meets the Lord. And First of all, he said, Who art thou, Lord? Boy, he had his religious act really together, didn't he, before that? Man, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a hot shot among the big shots. Religiously. But he, he didn't know the Lord. But that day the Lord introduced himself and he said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecute. And his first response was what? What would thou have me to do, Lord? What would you have me to do? From the very beginning, he understood that the will of God became the most important thing in a person's life when they received the Son of God as their Savior. And that's still true today. How sad it is that some folks can only think in, you know, in terms that, uh, of what they get as a result of being a Christian. And I can promise you, you can go to a lot of the mega churches and that's all you're going to hear. How you can improve this, how you can improve that, how you have your best life now, what you get, what you gain. When in reality, it ought to be all about the glory of God. That's what it ought to be. It's not what I get out of it. It's the glory that God gets from it. That's what really counts. Oh, it's wonderful that, that we get what we get being a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That is wonderful. But all of it from the very beginning, back before man was ever formed. God already knew in his mind exactly what was going to happen. And from the very beginning, he created everything, what? For his glory. For his glory. That ought to be the goal of our life. And the only thing that will enable us to live that life is to live in the constant awareness of how much the Lord loves us. Paul lived for the purpose of serving God and glorifying God. That's what I ought to do every day of my life. And that's what you ought to do. So how about it? At what level of maturity, spiritually speaking, do you want to stop? 
I don't know about you, but I want to I want to keep learning as long as I'm living. And when the end comes, I want to be as much like Jesus as I possibly can. That will be the desire of our heart. And there shouldn't be anything stop us. And when it does, when we find ourselves, as Vance Habner used to talk about, getting in a rut. We're just in a rut. We didn't aim to get there. We didn't jump off in the ditch. We just, well, our life just got in a rut. We sing amazing grace, but there's no real joy in it. We, we come to church, but eh, if the truth is known, we'd rather be at home. Just in a rut. And the only way to get out of that rut is for you to get your focus back on how much Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That ought to mean something to each and every one of us. But David, if you'll come and we all stand together, if you're here today, you might be like the Apostle Paul before when he was known as Saul. He was en route to persecute Christians. He was very successful at it. In his mind, he was doing God a favor, getting rid of these Christians. The boy, when the Lord appeared to him that day, in the brightness of the light, all of a sudden, Saul realized, I'm, I'm up against something that I've never dealt with before. Who art thou, Lord? And the same one that met him, We'll meet with you this morning in your heart. Your religion's not going to get you to heaven. It's not even going to make you happy. But Jesus can do both. Would you trust Him? Maybe you just want to come and have a season of prayer just, just to make some things right with God. Would you do that while we sing? Yeah. Sure.